The letter of James packs a punch. It is small, three or four pages, but it is mighty. From James, we hear such powerful and challenging words as, count it all joy, all of it, even the suffering. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And what use is it if you have faith but nothing to show for it? Scholars suggest that James was not really a letter. It is treated as such, but it probably started as a sermon, a sermon that was widely circulated among Christian Jews who lived outside of Palestine. These are not the disciples in Jerusalem, and they are not St. Paul's Christians. They are not Gentiles. They are Hebrew people, many of them still worshiping in Jewish temples, but who are also followers of Jesus. In the second chapter of this meaty little sermon we call James, um, James takes on the age-old problems of class distinction and insidious snobbery. James tackles the terrible reality that churches sometimes play favorites, pandering to people of wealth while denigrating people who are poor. He wants his readers to consider a very specific form of discrimination. There are all kinds of discrimination. They are all wrong. They are all terrible. But here he takes on a specific form, discrimination based on money. Treating a person based on what they have or what they don't have. As Roger Staubach said, discrimination is a disease. The Greek word that we find for discrimination in James and elsewhere in the Greek scriptures sounds just like a disease. Prosopolempsia. <laughs> it sounds fatal, and sometimes it is. Prosolempsia, prosopolempsia. It means giving judgment based on outward appearances. Churches of all places are called to be sanctuaries of extravagant welcome, where there is equality of treatment for all, including rich and poor. Jesus challenged both groups, the poor and the rich, telling the poor that they had a unique responsibility, the kingdom of God belongs to them and warning the wealthy that it is going to be very difficult for them even to set foot in the kingdom of God. But Jesus had friends and disciples who were rich, and he had friends and disciples who were poor. And so the church is called to befriend all regardless of social strata or any other distinction. For two years, when I was a seminary student, I worked in a very fancy church, West Hampton Beach Presbyterian Church. The Hamptons. <laughs> Playground of the rich and famous. Old money, new money. Behemoth beach homes. Fancy clothing, fancy cars, fancy shops. But... What struck me as I served that congregation is that the church was the one place where everyone in the community came together, old and new, rich and poor. To my idealistic eyes, it appeared that no one was more important than anyone else in the church, just because they had money, or just because they didn't, or just because their family had been in the church for 10 generations, or just because they were shiny and new. Rich and poor and everyone in between sat side by side in the same pews. Rich and poor served faithfully as ruling elders of the congregation. It felt to me like an oasis of equality 
in a region known for its condescensions. And so the first time I experienced an ugly moment of prosopolempsia, the supreme pretentiousness that is all too common, not only in churches, but wherever, wherever people congregate, wherever human beings congregate. The first time I experienced there uh, that, that prosopolempsia at West Hampton Beach Presbyterian Church, I, I was heartbroken. It happened on a Christmas Eve. There was a wonderful young man in the church youth group named Kevin who came from a family of lesser means. I think his father was a janitor, and if I'm recalling properly, his mother had died when he was um, a little boy. Kevin asked me at a Sunday evening youth group meeting if I thought it would be okay for him to come to church on Christmas Eve with his father. Of course, I answered cheerfully. I was thrilled because Kevin didn't come to church. Kevin came only to youth group. He attended only the youth group. Kevin told me that his father didn't own a suit or a dress jacket, and did I think, he asked, if it would be okay if his father wore a nice sweater over a shirt and tie? Of course, I answered again, of course. They were so excited to come to church together as father and son for the first time, and I was happy to see them there. But then, it wasn't okay. One of the earnest elders of the church asked him, right, asked his father, right there in the sanctuary on Christmas Eve, when we're, when we're there to ponder the Prince of Peace born in a humble stable, where his suit jacket was. Thank heavens we don't live in the Hamptons, right? We live on the perfect peninsula where no one would ever pander to the prosperous or put down the poor, right? No? Well, I suppose no community and no congregation is ever immune from the disease of prosopolempsia, from the problem of class distinctions and discriminations. We profess that as a church, we are welcoming of all. Our open and affirming statement hanging at the entrance of the sanctuary, and I think it's, Sue, can you put that up? Thank you. A part of that statement says, we seek to embody a faith that transcends all differences. And we are committed to affirming every person as a unique and precious creation of God. By the grace of God, we joyfully and gratefully welcome all persons who wish to be part of our community into the full life, leadership, and ministry of the church. While we do not carry out this statement perfectly, I have been deeply pleased over and over again by the shining moments in which we do carry it out well. Last year, for instance, an interesting fellow came to church, sat in the back. You couldn't miss him. He wore two layers of well-worn sh uh, shorts with tall purple socks, and he probably hadn't showered in a while. Now, it usually takes me a while to get downstairs following worship. When I got there that morning, to my delight, all sorts of people were chatting with this fellow. They discovered he was riding his bicycle across the country and living out of a small satchel. It was an act of faith. As a church, we got to know him. We asked him what he needed for his journey. 
We treated him as a neighbor and as an equal. We don't always get it right, but we got it right that morning, and by the grace of God, we will keep trying. The second chapter of James is an invitation to every church to, to do some soul searching, to ask questions about how and when we judge one another, and about how and when we allow, as James puts it beautifully, the mercy of God to triumph over human judgment. Beyond the ever-present challenges of judging by appearances and playing favorites, the second chapter of James calls us to greater social equality, to make decisions and to take actions that address economic injustices. According to James and according to Jesus, whenever we advance policies that make the rich richer and the poor poorer, we distance ourselves from the kingdom of God. And whenever we narrow that gap between rich and poor, we advance the realm of God where there are no favorites. You know, every great spiritual awakening in our beloved nation has been accompanied by a call to social equality and economic justice. In the wake of the, the first great awakening, the first great spiritual awakening in the 18th century, John Murray, our founding pastor, advocated for greater equality. As Chip Griffin summarized in our church history, and I will quote Chip, <laughs> Murray illuminated many political, social, and economic ills. In 1793, Murray helped lead agrarian land reform when he delivered a radical address and published a famous pamphlet in his attempt to prolong the American Revolution's goals of equality and liberty. Charles Grandison Finney, perhaps one of the great preachers, the greatest perhaps, um, of the second great awakening in the 19th century, promoted social equality in the name of Jesus, encouraging education for women and calling for the abolition of slavery. And during the Gilded Age, as we entered the 20th century, Congregational Minister Washington Gladden, if you remember your history, he was a, a popular voice in the social gospel movement, denounced what was rampant exploitation of the poor and called once more for economic fairness. Well, here we are in the 21st century, and according to the International Monetary Fund, Widening income inequality is the defining challenge of our time, globally and nationally. In the world's advanced economies, the gap between rich and poor is at its highest level in decades. The rich are getting preferential treatment, and the poor are being bled to death. This is an old problem, as old as humanity itself, but this is also a fresh problem, as fresh as who gets what in the latest tax legislation. In facing these age-old problems, prosopolemsia, playing favorites, is simply incompatible with Christian faith. We may have little control over tax legislation, but we have a fair amount of control over what happens here, in this church, in this community. The person who shows up here dripping in bling should expect the same treatment, which in the church is the same love, the same love as the person who shows up in a grubby t-shirt. The church is the place where we live the fact that God sees beyond the grub, sees beyond the bling. The church is where we advocate for the poor and teach generosity to all. 
And finally, the church is the place where God's mercy does indeed triumph, triumph over all of our flawed human judgments. So may it be. Amen.